Hello and welcome, my friend. We have got such a juicy episode today. When I tell you I ran, ran to talk about this with you, I am not exaggerating. The second I saw this yesterday, I posted it on my story. I, sh- I should give you more specifics of what I'm talking about, but let just hear me out for the, for the uh, start of this. Second, I saw this information that I'm going to share with you in today's podcast. I ran to my Instagram story to post it, and then I did a live, and then I automatically started to create this outline for today for us to talk about the carnivore diet and the breaking news within the carnivore diet as well. I have dove right into the description of what we're talking about today, though, without even introducing myself because my excitement has taken over me. (laughs) So let me just give you a little insight into who I am if you don't know me. I'm also recognizing, if you guys don't know, I record these episodes both on YouTube and on my my podcast, and I'm recognizing that the scene we have right now in the YouTube video is very dark, so I'm going to have to fix the lighting. If you're watching the YouTube, all I can say is ring light to the rescue. Am I right? Because wow, look at that lighting difference. But back to what I was saying, to introduce myself and to introduce you to my content, my name is Mallory Page. I am a registered dietitian. I view things from a non-diet perspective, and I love to talk about diet culture and the way that diet culture really infiltrates many things within fitness, wellness, nutrition, ED recovery, current events, and so much more. So every single week I come to you with a new topic that we can dissect and hopefully give you information that you may not have heard about before so that you can make the most informed decision possible about how you want to interact with something. The truth is most of the content that we see in magazines, on social media, and even that a lot of people talk about, it's very diet culture oriented because that is just the typical within our society. And even though we've had these non-diet movements, it's still a lot of what you hear. So I really try to bring the unbiased scientific information to you that can actually help you to just know what's really going on. So that is even more true than ever before in today's episode when we're talking about the carnivore diet. And as I've already mentioned, something that just happened surrounding the carnivore diet and one of the main proponents of it or one of the main What is the word I even want to use for this? Supporters feels like it's not even strong enough. Crusaders, maybe. (laughs) Oh my gosh, of this diet. So we're going to get into that in a little bit, but I feel like we have to start off by just talking about what the carnivore diet even is. And I think the most important thing that I want to touch on before I dive into this is that There is a lot of variation to how people interact with the carnivore diet. It it depends person to person, and I feel like the way that people do it can have its own almost like subculture, like the the different ways that people interact with the carnivore, carnivore diet almost becomes its own thing, and so We're not going to get into every single intricacy of every single way that you can do the carnivore diet today. We're just going to talk about it at large, and I'm going to give you what it is, when it gained popularity, why it gained popularity, why people choose to do it, the research or lack of research behind it, and then also this new uh, breaking news around this. So starting off with what the carnivore diet is. In its most simplistic form, the carnivore diet is a diet that entirely is made up of or consists of animal products such as meat, fish, eggs, and some dairy products. There are some people that do very intense carnivore diets where they pretty much only eat red meat and along with that, they'll consume butter. And then there are less intense carnivore diets. I feel more like the one that I just described. And again, those people usually have different reasons as to why they do them and they think of them as different. But in 
in simplicity, it is what I just listed. Now, this means that you're excluding pretty much all plant-based foods, fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, nuts, all of that stuff. And many people doing the carnivore diet consider these to be bad. These things that they think you genuinely should not eat and are bad for your health, not just that they avoid them. That doesn't mean everybody, but there are definitely a lot of them that do. And this diet, believe it or not, actually did start to gain popularity and kind of originated back in 2010. But I feel like I didn't see a ton about it until around 2018. And then it really took off around 2020 to now. And some of the first people I feel like that were talking about this in the mainstream were people like Jordan Peterson and his daughter. And they were talking about it for the health benefits, autoimmune benefits, all of that type of stuff. But Paul Saldino, who we're going to be talking about a little bit later, was definitely another one of the big proponents of this movement because he even wrote a book about this and talks about it very readily on his Instagram. And there are a lot of other carnivore diet influencers, carnivore diet pages, but those are some of the biggest ones. And as I just mentioned some, people choose to follow the carnivore diet for tons of different reasons. Some people choose to do it for weight loss. Some people feel like it helps with mental clarity. Some people feel like it helps with their energy levels. But the main reasons why I've seen people doing it are definitely autoimmune diseases and then digestive issues. Those are the biggest ones and I feel like the areas where the diet has had the most traction. But obviously weight loss is always a strong proponent and even if there are other reasons why people do choose to do the carnivore diet, oftentimes weight loss is like an underlying theme that's underneath that. So I have put off, for lack of a better word, doing the carnivore diet for a long time because something that I really like to be able to do on my podcast is go to the research. And I like to be able to go to research because ultimately, research is a part of what helps us to be able to more definitively prove the outcomes of something. And with that being said, research is always changing, right? That's one of the challenging and cool things about it is that there's new things we're always discovering and finding out. And yet at the same time, it makes it very difficult when something like the carnivore diet comes out because, you know, when it's just coming out a little bit in the 2010s, people aren't going to study it, at least not in a way that they can get a lot of participants, a lot of money to be able to fund these studies. Now, once it gets to a time like we're in now where everybody's doing it, there are people that want to study it, but then the same issues can still come up of funding, getting participants, or even just the fact that in order to have good studies that give us long-term outcomes, you need time. So the thing about the carnivore diet is there really is no true research about it. There is one study that was done in uh, like on social media in 2021 and essentially, I shouldn't say it was done on social media. They looked to social media to get a lot of their sample responses. So it is called Behavioral Characteristics and Self-Reported Health Status Among 2029 Adults Consume 2029 Adults. Sorry, it's not the year 2029. Consuming a Carnivore Diet. So what they did is they did this social media survey from the 30th of of March to the 24th of June in 2020 among adults that were self-identifying as consuming a carnivore diet for more than six months. And the survey questions interrogated motivation, dietary intake patterns. I don't know why I'm struggling to speak so much, so thank you for sticking with me. Symptoms suggestive of nutritional deficiencies or adverse effects. Satisfaction, prior and current health additions, anthrop- anthropometri- <laughs> ah! anthropometrics, and laboratory data. So they took all this information and put together some different results. And these were as simplistic as saying that red meat consumption was reported as daily or more, often by 85% of people, and as 
you know, complex as looking at the fact that their LDL cholesterol was markedly elevated. But the thing about this study, you guys, is it having a survey as something we can look at is always valuable. But it is not something that we can actually look to as definitive and conclusive in its nature because there is so much potential for bias here. The people that are doing this survey are on the carnivore diet, so they are more bought into the carnivore diet. The people that researched this when I was looking into it, it seemed like there was a slight lean towards the bias of wanting there to be less detrimental symptoms from the carnivore diet. And that's seen in their conclusion, how they talked about that there were fewer adverse effects than they thought and higher satisfaction. And so even if this is interesting and it's a starting point, this is not the type of study that gives us a ton of to really work with. When we're looking at a research study, our ideal situation is a double-blind study where we have two different sample sizes, both the researchers and the participants are blind to who is being introduced to the intervention. So in this case, it would be the carnivore diet, which how hard would that even be to do, right? This is part of the problem with nutritional research is that it's very complex. So I wanted to mention this research study. I will, of course, include it in the show notes. But if someone is looking to that study as a way to say, oh, the carnivore diet does X, Y, and Z, that's just not something that we can say is truthful. It's more just a plot point to look at. Now, what often happens is that many of these big like proponents, why can I not decide on the word I want to say for this, of the carnivore diet, they will take research from different sources that they feel can connect to the carnivore diet in order to prove their claims. So they will look at studies on ketosis. They will look at studies comparing high fat, high protein, and low carb to high carb, low fat and lower protein or moderate protein, or they will look at studies that have uh, observed the health benefits of something like a red meat versus the cons. And I'm not going to lie to you, it is a lot of picking and choosing things that support their argument. Now, to be fair, everyone can do this from time to time within nutrition and wellness research because it's often how you form a hypothesis. You look at different areas that have some validity and some research to them and you take them together to form your hypothesis and then ideally you would study that. But I think it's important to note that just because you have a hypothesis or just because there's some different kind of pick and choose, pick like picking and choosing, that's not what I'm looking for again some research that you have gathered that you feel supports your bias, that does not, again, make it definitive. So we could sit here all day and go through all of these different research studies that could potentially relate that people use. But at the end of the day, it doesn't change what we're talking about because ultimately it still does not prove anything about the carnivore diet. And to be 100% honest with you, most of the research that is related to things that are involved in the carnivore diet, such as not eating plants, such as just eating raw or not raw meat. Although some people on carnivore diet do that. I saw a guy eating raw chicken the other day. Raw chicken. Speechless. Eating only red meat. All of those types of things in the current research that we have, have not been proven to be beneficial. Now, that's not saying definitively that we can say the carnivore diet isn't beneficial because, again, we don't have research on it. But it is saying that if you were to take the pieces of the carnivore diet, such as what I was just listing, and look at the studies we have on them, it's not shown to be helpful. Plants are consistently shown to be beneficial in your diet. Red meat is shown to be fine, but not something that is the most 
beneficial thing for your heart health. So I wanted to go through that because I think it's important. And yet at the same time, you'll see why it's not as satisfying when I'm going through this section because there's not so much that I can offer you and just say, yes, this is what we know, like I can in some of my other episodes that are very research heavy, such as the seed oils episode, such as, um, do I have a gluten episode? I was going to say the gluten episode and I can't remember. But I'll include some of the types of episodes that I'm talking about that really go deep into the research around things. So with that being said, I now want to talk to you about the clip that truly spurred everything for me that came from Paul Saldino on a podcast. And I'm going to explain who this man is more in depth here in a second. But before we get to that, I actually want to play you the clip. Here's into the carnivore diet, I started noticing persistence of unpleasant symptoms. So testosterone dropped to around 500 total, sleep disturbances, palpitations, muscle cramps when I was surfing or climbing. And I started to think, okay, maybe long-term ketosis is not great for me. Sounds suboptimal for sure. At that point, I started to dig into the research a little bit more. Could have done that before he wrote a carnivore book, but hey-ho. I had to really kind of look at what I was doing and make this sort of learning judgment that long-term ketosis was not a great thing for me and probably not a great thing for most humans. Honestly, I am torn. I love seeing people change their mind publicly. Admitting mistakes shows maturity and growth. But he was one of the biggest carnivore proponents in the world. Wrote a whole book claiming it was the secret to unlocking optimal health. He helped kickstart an entire movement which he is now saying is probably not great for most humans. General rule of thumb? Don't trust people who make one specific diet their whole identity. The likelihood of them giving you unbiased advice is even less than half a smidge above. He ends that with an expletive that we're not allowed to say on this podcast without having to move it into a different section of podcasts. <laughs> so I cut it off there, but I wanted to play you that whole video because I love his perspective and I'm going to be expanding on a lot of the things that he was already saying in that clip. But before I get into that, I do want to give you a little bit of backstory onto who Paul Saldino is. So that's the guy that Ben was commenting on that was speaking in the initial clip about how he had all these realizations about carnivore and ultimately long-term ketosis. So to give you a funny description, you may remember this guy as the man that walks around the grocery store without his shirt and shoes on. If you know, you know. To give you a more realistic explanation, he is someone that has a doctorate in psychiatry. This is extremely important because this man loves to market himself as a doctor, which yes, he has a doctorate, but he is not a medical doctor. He did not go to med school. And although it is very impressive to get your doctorate in psychiatry, it does not make you a medical doctor. People love to do this. There's so many people that, that do this online. And also, you know what's even worse? He went to my alma mater. He went to University of Arizona. And that just pains me. Pains me. So he has around 2 million followers now on Instagram, and he wrote a book in 2020 called The Carnivore Code. And in this book, he shares claims such as vegetables and fruits being unhealthy, red meat being what you should consume, and a whole other number of carnivore diet type of claims. And now... As of not that long ago, he comes onto the podcast making those claims. And when I saw this, as I already told you guys, I ran to you with this information, but I also was simultaneously so shocked and not shocked at all. And let me explain why that is. To me, it is so genuinely shocking how people can promote something that they don't actually have any research to back up and they and furthermore they don't even have enough experience on it themselves to be speaking on it if you listen to him he was sharing how 
it was like, I think around two years in when he started to recognize that long-term ketosis probably wasn't good for him in most humans, which is a, the fact that he would even admit that. I mean, I will give props just as a slight aside. I do agree with Ben. I give props to him for being this willing to go on and ultimately change his viewpoint because I do think it's important to foster a space within nutrition and wellness and just in general where people are able to change their mind. But I don't understand why he would not have, I don't know, spent two years in long-term ketosis or spent freaking five years in it before writing an entire book. And it's not the fact that he wrote the book or that he talks about what if he talked about what worked for him. But he wrote this book and he speaks on social media in a way that was telling people this is what they needed to do, that they were wrong if they ate vegetables, they were wrong if they eat fruits. It was wrong to not eat on the carnivore diet. That is not the same as saying, hey, I'm doing this thing. I don't know if it works for other people. I don't even know if it will work for me long term, but I'm trying it out and here's what I'm noticing. People have autonomy to choose what they want to do. That is a huge belief system of mine. Yet that does not mean that people should be sharing things definitively as if they're fact when they don't even know if they are fact. It just, it blows my mind. Obviously, you can tell I'm very passionate about this. But the reason why I'm passionate is just because of how much it hurts people. I just don't think that we can comprehend how much his actions have genuinely hurt and harmed people. And that's why it makes me upset. It's not because he changed his perspective, but because of what this has done. And now he just nonchalantly shares that he thinks it's not good for most people and goes into these very extreme dangerous symptoms. And you may be wondering, why would he do that? And there's two different parts here that I want to discuss. There's actually three different parts that I want to discuss. And I will name the things that I feel are more, you know, educated inferences and things that are more of my opinion and theory. So starting off with some of my kind of educational guesses about this. Number one, I think that diet culture is so pervasive that it's often hard to even recognize that. And this is a really good case of that because what we're seeing is something that was very extreme and things that are extreme become sensationalized because people want to feel like there is something really intense that they can do that will just change everything for them. And the carnivore diet was one of the things that fit very well into this. And it made people spend money, which is the point of wellness culture. It's the point of diet culture. And it had a powerful movement behind it from also some of the most powerful sources that push diet culture information forward, which is white men that live in bodies that are more privileged or fit looking. Now, the second thing that I want to say is when someone has a doctorate behind their name and when they speak really loudly about things, it is always going to garner more attention because people feel like what they're reading is very valid and what they're hearing is very valid. And that makes them more likely to kind of fall into the traps of the information that is being set before them. So he wrote a whole book around this, right? Speaking about all the things that people said were wrong. And if he didn't have a doctorate behind his name, and if he wasn't arguably probably quite smart, I don't know how you could get a doctorate in psychiatry if you're not smart, then people probably wouldn't have listened as strongly as they did and it probably wouldn't have had as much power behind it. Now, the next thing I'm going to say is more so my own theory and this could be wrong, but this is what I am thinking. I 
cannot believe that this man is stupid. Because as I just said, he would not have been able to do the things that he's done. He wouldn't be able to market himself on social media as he has. He wouldn't be able to write a book. He wouldn't be able to get a doctorate in psychiatry if he was not a smart guy. And to go along with that, something that people have noticed about him is that he has the tendencies to go to extremes. So if I'm remembering correctly from what I've looked up, there was a time where he was like, completely extreme vegan. And then he switched all the way over to this other side. So you could look at this two ways. You could say, oh, he has a tendency for extremes and his personality, and he likes to test things for himself. You also could look at it in a way that I think is more likely and more so what's happening here, which is that diet culture, as I already mentioned, loves extremes and that's what makes money. So he has gone from extreme to extreme because as you do that, you attract more people. It's more polarizing. It's more interesting. And that makes him more money and it gets him more attention. And I I bet that he is starting a new movement for his next diet or lifestyle. I guarantee that over the next, well, I won't guarantee it. I guess that over the next couple of years, we're going to see him coming out with something new. I think it's going to be gradual. I think at first, it's going to just be him saying that long-term ketosis isn't good, which is really what he was talking about in that podcast, and then just go to carnivore. Then I think he's going to start moving away from the carnivore diet, and he's going to enter into something new. And it's going to be gradual because he doesn't want to shock his audience completely. He doesn't want them to catch on to the fact that he's doing this, but that is what I would personally guess based off my knowledge of his intelligence level and also my knowledge of his past history. Again, that is my bias. This is not research fact-based, which is always important to call out in this podcast, but oh, this shocked me. And I just think that ultimately the takeaway here is Diet culture is a never-ending trap. Like Ben said on his point, anyone that is hinging their identity, their entire brand on telling you that there is only one way to eat, live, exercise, whatever it is, they are likely giving you very biased information that often does not have anything to back it up. And that can be a very, very dangerous thing to do. And it's not me sitting here saying that no one's ever had a positive experience on carnivore or no one's ever had a positive experience on ketosis. I mean, that for a fact is wrong, right? Ketosis was originally developed as a treatment for people with epilepsy, children specifically. So we know that this, we're not sitting here trying to argue carnivore diet in and of itself. At least I'm not in this podcast. But anybody that makes it seem like they do know that they know that something is helpful for you and yet their only true research is their experience that hasn't even been very, you know, in depth or prolonged. It's just a recipe for disaster. And for that reason, This is a 10 out of 10 diet culture rating. This is the most diet culture-y thing ever. The whole nature of it and the carnivore diet itself and how people speak about it now and also the way that he is now shifting. So there's so much more we could talk about with this diet. I know a lot of people that are currently on it. I understand that There are many nuances to why people go on it. I can always make a follow-up episode on this if that's something you guys like. And as you know, you can always just check out the description for links to submitting episode ideas. You can shoot me a DM. You can find links for my free masterclasses, free calls with me, um, my programs, all that kind of stuff down there, and also my Instagram, of course. And I so appreciate you hanging out with me today and listening to me get overly ranty about this topic. (laughs) Oh my gosh. So thank you for being here. I will see you guys hopefully 
very soon. Bye.